conversations among community leaders, practitioners, and scholars, reflecting on the relationship between restorative justice and built environment disciplines from the perspective of historically disenfranchised communities. I'm Clarita Sara, Professor and Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Officer for the School of Architecture, Planning, and Preservation, University of Maryland College Park. I thank Hannah Cameron, co-organizer of the series, Dean Jordan and her office, and our communications and IT teams for their support of this series. I also thank all the speakers who graciously share their wisdom with us. As an offering of the school's Jedi Collaborative, this series is composed of four dialogue sessions. They take place in the context of a community planning studio course, working with and for the Lakeland community, a historic African-American community, neighboring our university park or, or campus that both our university and city are collaborating with in efforts to restore justice. This is the fourth and last dialogue in the series called Property, Housing and Land, Pillars or Barriers of Restorative Justice. It proposes that regimes of property are at the heart of housing and land contestations as they anchor conceptions of rights, sustainability, and humans' relationship to the more than human world. How are they currently conceived versus how could they be reconceived in a restorative justice-built environment? Our hope is that the dialogue series help us plant good seeds in the soils of our spatial disciplines from where restorative justice can flourish. The recordings of the four sessions will be publicly available within a week. I now introduce Noeli Alvarez, a PhD candidate in the school. He will be introducing the speakers and moderating this fourth dialogue. Noeli. Thank you. Thank you so much. And welcome everyone here in person and virtually. So great for you all, for all of us um, to be here today to discuss this very important topic and a way to conclude this very critical dialogue series as well um, this fall. So to present um, the speakers, um, all of our speakers are virtual today. Today we have Dr. Prentice Dantzler, Assistant Professor in Sociology at the University of Toronto. We have Dr. Heather Doris, Assistant Professor in Geography and Planning at the University of Toronto. Um, and we have Dr. Magdalena Ugarde from the Toronto Metropolitan University in Latin American and Canadian Indigenous Perspectives. And we also have a video. Um, unfortunately, Dr. Don Florin can't make it today. So she is our dean, she's a lawyer, and she's a planner, double, triple whammy. Uh, but we have a video from her where she will discuss um, her four minute presentation with us. So with that said, uh, today's respondents include Lakeland, from Lakeland, uh, Robert Thurston, uh, president of Lakeland Civic Association. And we have our community planning studio um, student who is here today, Katie Dyson. Um, so I request that all speakers today um, have a four minute presentation that goes along with our topic today. Um, Hannah's gonna keep time and show cue you with the hand raised on Zoom. So that will be your little way of knowing. Um, and then we will kick it off with questions. Um, I will present you with all with a question and then we will lean in towards our respondents today for more questions and the audience, uh, we ask that if you have any questions and we have enough time, maybe you can please add it in the chat as well and we will get to it towards the end. So thank you. So who would like to go first? Call the order this time. Yeah, okay. Dr. Prentice Gantler, why don't you go ahead and you're first in line. All right, my job is to do this in four minutes. So I'll try my best. <laughs> I know it's a very, very, it, it's hard. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Um, thank you for having me today. Thank you for the invitation. And thank you for having this important conversation. Um, so a lot of my work has been, has transitioned. I did a lot of training in policy and kind of got frustrated with a lot of our approaches around housing and property relations. 
And after kind of looking and being a little bit more critical about how we we're thinking about housing justice or just uh, reparative justice or restorative justice in general, I don't think we're doing a good job overall. A lot of the ways in which we have different urban development projects or different housing initiatives tend to just reify, reproduce the same type of inequalities that we're largely seeing in different areas. And at the same time, we still have this idea of private property as the, the primary way in which to kind of give and sustain housing. And my biggest critique would be like, that's the problem, right? When we look at the legacies of private property ownership, it was only for certain people, right? White Christian males in the US context who actually could take handle of that and actually use it to generate wealth and control land, but also to do political engagement like voting. So when I really think about what justice means in a sense, I kind of think about it in two ways. And this is to me in my kind of bigger sense of like a, a politics of intervention. In a lot of ways, we're mitigating particular issues. Uh, and those tend to be those very much instantaneous issues that are affecting households or marginalized communities, right? So these are things like, you know, emergency assistance, you know, you get federal grant money to come in to do this one initiative, and that may mitigate some type of issue or, or have some type of alleviation strategy. But when we're talking about restorative justice or reparative justice, we're thinking about transformation or systemic changes. And I say a lot of times we kind of fall short in that area and even community groups and neighborhoods and um, grassroots organizations are fighting, they're fighting for pieces of that, that bigger dream. So for me, when I really think about what justice means is thinking about a drastically different housing system, one where private property ownership is not the only or primary goal, where we have other things like community land trust as a, as a normalized function, where we have things as renters actually being, you know, deserved and desired in different areas. And I would say in a lot of ways, and when we think about past trauma, we haven't even started to talk about issues of like redress and repair, right? And a lot of things, when we think about issues of like truth and reconciliation, what does it mean to have your needs felt and met? Um, that's where I see a lot of things being fall short. So my dream in terms of like pushing forward uh, my own research, but even like the larger projects I'm engaged in, is to really kind of rethink a more holistic housing system that doesn't just pri privilege, you know, property owners or homeowners, and that really thinks about different ways in which people can live together. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Story? Yeah, thanks. Thanks Thanks for inviting me to this conversation. I think this is a really interesting topic and it's great to be in conversation with all of you and, and, and to see Prentice again, who is, I know, a colleague, maybe, I'm not sure if we're even in the same building, possibly. Oh, not. Well, we've been together in virtual meetings, but we still haven't met uh, in person, but um, I'm really looking forward to that day. Um, so yeah, th this is such a, to me, a really important topic. You know, a lot of, a lot of my research has focused on the ways that um, planning is implicated in processes of uh, racial capitalism and settler colonialism. Um, and so advancing processes of dispossession uh, and assimilation, also often criminalizing people who are uh, engaged in resisting, resisting those processes of dis dispossession. I'll say more about that in a minute. Um, but as, as someone who's also trained in planning, um, you know, property is kind of the, the for me, the, the nexus or the point of connection between processes of dispossession or colonial dispossession or racial capital dispossession and um, planning, because both of those hinge on particular understandings and conceptions of property. You know, property is really central for planning processes. I think we can imagine many of kind of the typical understandings of planning or uh, mainstream understandings of planning as being a, a, a tool through which um, relations between users or, and uses, land users and land uses are, are organized and um, ordered into a coherent landscape. So property in that way is really central to delineating the sphere of planning and, and enabling, um, you know, all of the many of the other concepts that we work with in planning, you know, things like highest and best use, which is really a way of ascribing a set of you know, value, economic value to um, property and to land through through property and through a logic of improvement that works through property. Um, 
And this preservation of private property and the, the use of private property uh, property as a tool in planning also makes planning complicit in the, the maintenance of this property regime and the, the carceral regime that it sustains it. So if we think about all the rights that get ascribed to property and to property owners, that all relies on you know, a regime of policing, uh, a legal regime that also punishes people who violate you know, the, the, the laws of, of property and the protections that are ascribed to people through property. So planning scholars, at, you know, as you've probably been discussing, have been starting to talk about how property, through our planning through property uh, is entangled with things like settler colonialism and racial capitalism and um, uh, tied up with processes that are, you know, always anti-Indigenous, anti-Black through their engagements with property and how planning is uh, uh, informed by and takes up a racial regime of, of planning, right, that imposes a racial hierarchy that results in the accrual of social, economic, and, and political benefits to whites. So it's, it's at the core of the injustices that planning is often implicated in. So one of the things that I've been thinking about is, well, what is the alternative? Like, can we think about approaches to planning that don't hinge on property? I mean, when we, I think, um, you know, planning needs to be radically changed. I don't, I don't want to give up on planning. I think it's a way of, of thinking about intentionally thinking about our lives and how we live in, in relation to each other, but then to also think about alternatives. I, I'll just conclude by saying, um, I think one of the ways to start thinking about alternatives to property um, is to think about, you know, what the, the, the functions of property are. We often think of property as being like this one, one thing, but um, scholars of property will often talk about property being a, a bundle of rights, some of which are inscribed in law and some of which aren't. And these include the right to benefit property, to benefit from property, um, the right to compensation, um, and, and those are protected in law. But there are also other things that property does for us um, that are, aren't protected in law. And these are, um, it's really currently seen a, a way of securing your you know, the place where you live, securing your, your right to housing, um, securing your future, maybe your retirement. You know, if we think about property as a, you know, for many people, it's an investment vehicle. It's a way they secure their, their retirement. We, I think we can have all of that without property. We don't need property to be secure in our homes. We don't need property to be secure in our futures and in the places where we live and, and to benefit from, um, you know, the things in, in the environment that might sustain us. So how can we start to, to think about what it is we need and what the, the alternatives might be to providing those? And I think that can be an important role of planning. You know, um, planning is a practice that would support what the provision of things that we need to survive. Um, Practices of being and belonging rather than exclusion and, and, and domination. I think those are you know, some of the ways that we might start to think about what planning can be that isn't reliant on property. Thanks. Dr. Magdalena Ugasi. Yes, yeah. thank you. Thank you so much. And yeah, my apologies for being a few minutes late. I'm just coming back from a field trip course and literally the bus arrived like an, less than an hour ago and then there was heavy traffic. So thank you so much for the invitation, <laughs> Professor Irasabal. And thank you, Hannah, for coordinating everything. It's great to see yeah, familiar and unfamiliar faces and names. Um, yeah, so I think uh, I think I might have missed Prentice your 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 insights. I arrived just on time to hear uh, yours, Heather, uh, and I think some of the ideas that you that that were shared by Heather uh, are some of the ideas that also come to my mind when I think about. Um, 
um, what restorative justice means for planning and especially discussions around uh, land dispossessions in places with a settler colonial history. And like the US where many of you are, like Canada where I live, like Chile where I'm from and, and I do uh, most of my work. Uh, countries that in a way are founded on indigenous land dispossession, uh, which been enabled as Heather was pointing out through property regimes that are still in place today. Um, so in a way there is this foundational injustice uh, and this foundational complicity um, at the base of the planning systems we have today. And at the center of that injustice in this kind of context is really the taking of indigenous lands and, and the commodification of those lands, the commercialization and the trading in a way of those lands. And, and also the, this imposition, right, of, of ways of understanding who are the rightful um, quote unquote owners or the people who, who belong in those lands or who, who, who have a, a, um, the benefit of, of inhabiting there and being seen as, a, as the, yeah, the people who, who can't be there without being prosecuted, be, without being criminalized. Um, so I think in thinking about all these complicities, I think maybe there were three ideas that came to my mind when the questions were posed to us and to discuss today. Um, the first one being that um, at least in settler colonial context, it's not really possible perhaps to talk about restorative justice without talking about land restitution in, in, in some form, you know, which connects maybe to the second idea uh, that comes to my mind in the sense that conversations about restorative justice uh, need to also involve conversations about reparative justice, the idea of reparations. Um, which leads in a way to the third idea, which is that notions about private property, as, as Heather was, um, was mentioning, um, that are taken for granted in a way mainstream planning uh, discourse require uh, reconceptualization or, or outright maybe not, not even be <laughs> seen as the solution or the way of engaging with this uh, discussion. So um, maybe regarding the first point, um, so the, the, I believe that the paradigm of restorative justice, it's, it's important because it puts at the center the need to, uh, to acknowledge um, a wrong, but we think more broadly even beyond planning. And, um, so acknowledging the wrong and enable mechanisms that in a way are more collective, that enable some dialogue where uh, perpetrators of the wrong and, and individuals or communities that have been harmed, that ha can, have been wronged, can in a way confront that, that harm, uh, which starts with acknowledging. But in, in context where that harm is um, land dispossession, settler, colonial, indigenous dispossession, particularly, uh, the recognition of the wrong is important, but, but it seems um, insufficient. Uh, I don't know, perhaps it's what we might see in a land acknowledgement, you know, or um, so in a way, what purpose does acknowledging land dispossession in this case serve if the wrong is not corrected? So, and I believe that's maybe where the, this dialogue between restorative justice and reparative justice uh, seems <laughs> necessary. Um, and I believe, well, discussions um, like the land back movement here in North America, a, a clear example, but calls for reparations for in, in the context of African Americans. And, and I am just coming back from Windsor on a advanced field research is the name of the course. And, and we heard from um, really important conversations happening in the context of Windsor around the, the displacement and, and, and also the dispossession of um, of black communities uh, who are the, the descendants of uh, freedom seekers who cross from what's now the US. So, um, so yeah, maybe which leads me to the final idea because I'm running short on seconds here um, that <laughs> the, the reparations that are needed in the context of settler colonial disposition specifically uh, necessarily unsettle established ideas about land property. And as Heather was pointing out, they require um, Thinking, thinking beyond property in many ways. And, and I think some of those tools, I think are the tools that, that we planners can engage in. And some have existed for a long time. I'm thinking concrete things like, I don't know, community land trusts, uh, forms of collective ownership that emphasize, as Heather was pointing out, subsistence and, and belonging and presence in a place without necessarily that notion of um, possessiveness that it's embedded in, in ideas around property. Um, so maybe I will leave it there and, and then the conversation will probably bring, bring more. <coughs> Thank you so much. Oh, and now we have um, Dr. Don Jordan's video clip. So Hannah will share.
by African American people and then taken away by communities for the public good, for the developer development of a higher and better use, if you will, certainly racially motivated at the time. And in that one instance, the community has now given that, that property back to the family and its descendants. Certainly, this is possible. It is much easier to do when the land is publicly owned because publicly owned land can be bequeathed by, by the city to individuals much more easily than privately owned land. When we're talking about privately owned land, no matter how it's been acquired, the Fifth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution puts some severe limitations on the ability of the government to take that land away from a private individual and give it back to another. Um, but certainly, this is not out of the, the scope of conversation. As you know from your basic land use law class, that if you're going to take private property away, you have to pay just compensation. So somebody has to pay for the land. Um, that may be the community paying for the land. But then the land, as it's transferred to another private property owner under the law, has to be made available for public use. And the question is, can you take private property away from a white property owner, for example, um, pay them just compensation and give that land back to individuals as part of a reparation strategy? The jury is still out on that one. It has not been legally challenged. However, scholars are having vigorous debates about the um, constitutional parameters of what that might look like. If we were to look for a really good model of, of land reparations, we might turn our attention to post-apartheid South Africa. Really intentional decisions were made about restoration of land, land tenure, and land redistribution. As you may recall, as part of the General Lands Act during the apartheid era, property was taken away from Black landowners and given to white landowners. Um, without compensation. Um, certainly the vestiges of, of a colonial system. And at, at the point of post apartheid, the conversation was, how do we take that land that was removed from people, find original owners, heirs, or others that would benefit from land ownership and make that land available to them? Now they weren't bound by the U.S.'s Fifth Amendment to the Constitution. We are a private property rights country, and we always have been. That's why there is such an, a, a strong tie to land ownership and the use of land ownership to amass wealth. However, as we look at the laws and vestiges of the past, I think this is where most of the work that we need to do takes place, is to figure out how to get more land into the hands of individuals so that they can create the opportunities for themselves and for their communities and for their heirs in the way that so many of us has been able to do over time. Um, I'm looking forward to working with my students and colleagues to do more research in this area. And I'd be glad to talk with anybody who's interested about it, um, about your ideas of how might we accomplish land restoration as uh, one of the primary reparations that we make to persons of color who have not had the same opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much to all the presenters. Um, I guess I'll begin with one question. Um, th there's so much synergy coming from all of you and thank you so much again for presenting today on your work. I know it was a very short four minute presentation, but I'm sure we're all gonna have really great questions um, in an hour. <laughs> um, so, but I guess, you know, I was thinking of um, these synergies, you're all speaking on these alternatives within uh, another idea to think of a property. Um, what sort of alternatives are in your work that you propose? Uh, what do these alternatives look like? I know some of you mentioned community land trusts, and I feel like that's one of the most popular ones, but are there other ones that you guys have been looking into and how challenging has it been to push for these ideas? And whoever wants to go first. 
I can start if that works. Um, so I wrote a piece with a colleague, um, Asia Reynolds, who's a Black feminist scholar in education. And part of what we were trying to do um, in the general world systems, and part of what we were trying to do is like think about what reparations looks like in that context of capitalism. And I think part of what we were trying to get a grapple on is like a lot of the conversations around justice tends to be like give land back, do reparations without really understanding how those don't really undermine the larger political economy of place. And while I, I think those things should be done in, in various forms, I also would say that to disrupt what we're talking about or the long term kind of histories or legacies of slavery of dispossession and displacement, we really kind of need to dig deeper. So instead of in a conjunction with community land trust, if we think about, you know, shared equity mortgages or collective forms of ownership, if we think about what a, a large public or social housing system would actually look like in the context of the U.S., and, you know, planning has taught me that we plan very badly in terms of how we located public housing in the states. And then as a, when we didn't try to fix it, we just demolished it and switched to other types of programs. But what would a new vision of social housing look like in the context of the states um, where and there's other places that we can draw from to like, see what that means in terms of equity and everything else? Um, the, the biggest piece for me and the hardest part is kind of really, really rethinking the ideologies about how we live. And I think that's the, the piece that it's going to be harder to disrupt because everybody is kind of conditioned to think about home ownership and private or property ownership as the number one goal for themselves, right? A lot of times in which we're kind of navigating these spaces, we're, we're, we're going to school, we're getting jobs to support a family unit. We're going to think about ways in which we can create wealth or security for our children or our other family members. And by thinking about how it's all about ourselves, we kind of disrupt what we mean when we're living with each other. And I think to really get to that point where you can uh, you can really explore these kind of collective forms of ownership and how the individual is not not the main focus and how there are other just simple ways to live, right? What if we had a national rent control based on local um, fair market rates within neighborhoods? What would that do in terms of the increases that we see, and would it change how we think about wealth accumulation only being you know formed in the in the rights of private property? So for me, it's to think about a holistic system where you might have private ownership, but largely I would, you know, want to get away from that. But to more be more realistic and pragmatic, I think there are ways and tools that we have talked about, like see a community land trust, like shared or collective forms of ownership, like a bigger, drastically more um, engaged and politically savvy um, housing assistance programs like social housing to really get beyond this kind of very much individualistic private property model. Thank you. I don't know, Heather, if you had any, <laughs> because to both, I don't know. I think I, I, I hear what uh, Prentice saying. I think the, I mean, uh, the discussion, it's really, uh, it's super multifaceted. And I think no, no single uh, engagement would probably go to the core of the, of the matter. Um, I think the, um, I think again, moving maybe beyond, uh, trying to push hard to move beyond the the more mainstream understandings of property that are about individual property and usually also associated with these ideas really founded in whatever lock, you know, the idea that land that ownership tied to productivity that kind of like really um, taken for granted, but also um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, <sighs> Yeah, I, 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 I'm out of words in English, but um, nefasto <laughs> is the word in Spanish. <laughs> that, that really bad kind of like marriage of the idea of like yeah, owner, individual ownership tried to productivity, which in a way it's about like profit maximization. Uh, it's, it's really complex. And I think pushing beyond that, even through words that involve, through ways that involve property, but collective forms of ownership is kind of like a, maybe a step in, in the dismantling of the bigger, deeper problem. Um, I, I will, to, in my mind at least, and, and well, so most of the work I've done so far has to do, it has happened in Chile and it's in, uh, in collaboration with indigenous communities. And I believe that uh, much of what I've learned in a way has to do with this notion of um, when thinking about land and engaging with, with land and what lands, land means, um, what we might term um, 
use value as opposed to exchange value in a way comes clearly to the fore, even if those are not the concepts used. But the notion of um, do, do we need property? Do we need ownership? Or what we need is, as Prentice was mentioning, the yeah, in a way, the dynamics and, 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 and I don't know, tacit or explicit norms that allow us to, to exist in our multiplicity, in, in spaces, in ways that 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 protect, that ensure, um, particularly protection of the, the the natural environment too. I mean, the the, the land and the environments that sustain us. Um, but 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 existing in those spaces uh, in ways that that allow subsistence, that allow collective subsistence, and that, as Heather was saying, it doesn't necessarily require property in the way we understand it. It it requires. Um, Again, I, uh, yeah, I think it requires more, maybe less greed, <laughs> less greed and more ability to, uh, to, to try to think collectively. Um, yeah, I think I would leave it there for now. Okay. I, I'll just respond briefly. <laughs> I've had a chance to think about it. Um, you know, I find the number one question that, that planners and planning students always want to act is, ask is like, well, what are the examples? What are the, the cases that we can look at and, and learn from? And how do we implement this tomorrow? <laughs> and I appreciate that urgency because these are, these are urgent questions. But at the same time, I think it's really hard to point to any one particular model and say like, well, here's the thing that, that, that we should do. Here's, here's how we need to do this. And here's the 10 step plan. Um, because I think what we're talking about is just is, you know, radically undermining and challenging a lot of the core concepts that we've been working with in planning um, ideas, the ideas about property that we're working with are ideas that have been developed and enshrined uh, in legal economic social institutions for hundreds of years like how, how do we start to undermine those ideas that have been so firmly entrenched for so long. Like this is gonna take some, some thought, right? Um, and, and maybe to give you an example, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm excited by the potential that collective land ownership offers, you know, community land trust. I think these, there's, um, you know, a lot of attention being paid to these, these forms right now. And I, I think that that's great. Um, I was recently in con in conversation with an, a newly formed community land trust. I mean, I don't even think we could call it community land trust. They're in very early stages of, of forming in Toronto. And they invited me to a conversation because, you know, right at the beginning, they recognized that it was important to ask this question, like, how do we, how do we become an, an anti-colonial land trust? Like, we're going to create a land trust on land that, you know, at the beginning of our meetings, we always recognize that we're on the uh, the territories of the the Mississaugas of the the New Credit, the Haudenosaunee, and, and the Shinabeg, and and then then we go on to, to talk about land relations, and somehow there's a disconnect between <laughs> the, these land acknowledgments and these discussions about land that we're having. So what do we do? How, how do we keep from being becoming just another landlord. Like that's a that's something that a community land trust could could do. You could become another like collective landlord. So um and so they were thinking through the these questions really carefully. Um and you know one of the the things that we talked about and something that I mentioned already was you know asking the question, well what is it that we actually need our relations to to land and place to do like we're we're we we're gravitating to property using property because it offers a certain set of advantages supposedly right it does something something for us or for some people um not for everyone uh, what is it we what is it we need these relations to do what is it we're actually trying to, to get and are are there are there ways that we can can organize those relations that you know, aren't exploitative, aren't going to result in certain people being, being left out or being exploited. Um, and, and I think those are, that, you know, that's a challenging set of questions to answer and it's going to look different for different communities as well. Thank you so much. These are all great responses. Um, now we'll look at 
Katie, do you have a question? Yes, I have two actually, if oh. time allows. Um, however, I do, I do think it's funny to work, uh, when I first sat down to think about what I was going to ask tonight, I also had the first thought of what are case studies, what are some examples? So I'm glad I'm a typical planning student in that regard. Um, but for the actual question, number one, um, measuring restorative justice can be seen as quantitative in terms of land being returned to its rightful owners. But how can it be measured in a qualitative form? Like, does it go beyond policy? Um, and I am thinking in a very United States centric way right now, because that's where I am. Um, but if there's any uh, way to measure it qualitatively, I am all ears. I can dip right back in. So I'm primarily a quantitative scholar until I started asking different questions and then realized that the quant didn't get me there. So to this point, I think when we think about methods or ways to kind of analyze this, there's plenty of ways in which we can kind of co-produce knowledge with those communities, right? And and I think a lot of ways in which my, my biggest issue as somebody who is still still feels it like an imposter in the academic space is these ideas about why am I here and what is my purpose? And I think when you're in these spaces, whether you're a planning student, whether you're a professor, you, I'm, I'm really kind of thinking about, I don't wanna still have these same conversations in the next five to 10 years about anything. Like I, I feel like as much as we think about life in a very linear, like upwardly really linear fashion, we also need to think about our policy and recommendations reform efforts in that same fashion. And to Heather's point, and to like even my, my other colleagues' point too, it is just like thinking about this in terms of like felt needs by those communities, right? We can have all the objective measures in the world about how much land we're giving back to particular, you know, First Nation groups, or even how do you even kind of understand or impact the the case of like the Black American in this space, right? Um, there's a lot of ways in which you can think about it, but co-producing knowledge with these co communities, doing more of a grassroots approach where you're actually asking the real subjective questions. Uh, even a lot of my my more recent work in terms of thinking about neighborhood satisfaction, there are all these quality of life measures. But when you ask like very specific nominal questions about people and where they live, you'll get enough uh, a whole different set of insights from using those even quantitatively. So when we're really thinking about you know outcomes and like progress and positive effects, we really need to kind of underscore that where we probably are using the wrong proxies for understanding progress. Right. It doesn't matter if the land is given back if those people don't feel like they actually have utility or agency in actually using that land. Does it matter if you give somebody a check for reparations if that doesn't really disrupt their marginality in a larger system? So for me, it's really kind of thinking about ways to disrupt this kind of systemic approach as we're thinking about reform and not as like an end goal, but an ongoing process that we need to be constantly revisiting as we're engaged in this type of work. Thank you. Was that? That was question number one. Oh. There's time for question number two. Yeah. Uh, this is more of a scenario-based question. So the University of Maryland is on the ancestral lands of the Piscataway people. And I am wondering in the minds of you know all of our speakers today, uh, what would it look like if the university were to return the land back to the Piscataway people? Very open-ended, but <laughs> <laughs> or what would be what would be the most correct in terms of restorative justice? means of returning the land back? What would that mean for the university itself? I don't know. I, I think you have to start by asking the people who are there. Like that's a really difficult question for me to, to answer without knowing very much about the, the history of the, the university, its relations to the surrounding communities. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think um, I think again, these are these are conversations that uh, really need to happen in in their particular local context. Like that's that's where I think these conversations need to start. Thank you. Mister um, Horsley, would you like to? Yes. Um, thank you all very much for your insight and input. Um, my head is spinning a little bit here because um, restorative justice, as we have understood it, um, well, not understood it, but the goal, I would say, for Lakeland, in that two thirds of the community is actually is now gone, is protecting that footprint that is still there, and also. Um, 
to the piece of black and brown people, I guess this is two questions. When we start talking about changing the social dynamics, part of restorative justice is returning generational wealth loss, um, health implication. So how, how do we shift that paradigm to socialization when we're actually fighting for commodity, basically? I can go. Uh, so I, to your point, I, that's the issue, right? I think when we talk about restorative justice, we, we've problematized this understanding of the commodity and that shouldn't be the focus. It wasn't the commodity in, in, in itself. A lot of the other scholars that write about restorative justice tend to focus on like values and dignity and humanity within those justice approaches. And so the, the commodity piece kind of falls short. And, and what happens is a lot of times when we have in these conversations, we always focus on a commodity being that, that tool or that mechanism by which people can get back their dignity or their values or their humanities that has been largely stripped away from them. So for me, it's really kind of thinking about this kind of bigger understanding or this kind of nuance, very nominal and very kind of ordinary, like what does community mean in this sense? And I think when we think about community at various scales, then you, you can kind of disrupt this notion that property and land is the only way by which people can reclaim or regain their humanity or value within a broader society. Now, what does that mean for me? For me, it's like, I, I, I care less about the items and more about the agency and efficacy of people to dictate their own lives. And for me, that's the piece that I think it, when we are talking about, you know, perpetual harm or the legacy of slavery, it's not just the idea they were stripped away wealth, it was the manner in which it was done, right? And it also functionally changed the ways in which people actually engaged in government. If you asked about, if you asked anybody that if they thought they were going to go to the DMV and get a driver's license and leave in like an hour, nobody would say they would, right? Because we've already conditioned ourselves to know that that's going to be a place where we're going to be all day. And I think that same type of mentality or that same type of conceptualization about how the government works needs to be altered and changed. We don't have a lot of faith in the government because we have these histories about the ways in which they marginalize, exploit it, and distract it and dispossess people and groups across different communities and scales. So for me, it's one, we have to re-envision what that means. When we think about a different government system, what does that look like? When we think about ways to actually do redress and repair and truth and reconciliation, what does that look like? And so for me, it's the process by which you include people and give them stronger forms of agency and efficacy to dictate their own needs versus subscribing this kind of notion that, you know, if we give people housing or if we give them land or we give them property, then they're able to participate still in the capitalistic society. And that for me is the problem where you're kind of just reifying that by re reproducing these exchanges of commodities. So I'm more interested in thinking about kind of more novel ways that you can think about certain values that you can give people around like agency, efficacy, and just having the rights to participate in a larger democratic society. And for me, that can come up in the forms of giving land back or even different forms of representative governments at their local level, or even shifting power dynamics of who actually controls land in different spaces. And I think that helps kind of address some of these tensions. But to your point, the wealth creation, and I think Heather said something important about this in her talk is that we always subscribe property ownership, the idea is that we, this is the way we get other resources and amenities. And that's probably deeply problematic in so many ways. That's your entryway into getting some of these resources and amenities. But what if we had a government system that actually supplied the basic amenities and resources that we all know we need, right? Like education, health, and so on and so forth. So for me, it's kind of disrupting this notion of just thinking about the commodity or those fixed entities or objects that we're transitioning or translating from one group to another, and really think about value systems that we're changing in a different form of governance to really think about ways of mutual participation or inclusion into a broader democratic society that has a lot of diverse people in it, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Thank you so much. And now we're gonna open it up to the floor for any questions and um, on Zoom as well. Great. Um, so we have one, a question first from Maxine Gross, who is also a Lakeland resident. And she asks, thank you for contributing to this conversation. Many exciting ideas were discussed during these sessions. How best may we involve scholars like you in making concrete contributions to building successful outcomes for this specific community? Um, speaking to Lakeland and the history um, of, of, the, of the Lakeland community, um, which 
as we've gone on throughout the series, but I'll just um, give a, a quick recap. The students in planning community planning studio are working um, to, oops, sorry, the chat is also going, um, working to look at scenario planning outcomes for um, the Lakeland community, which is a historic black community in College Park, Maryland. Um, that has been dispossessed and disinvested through um, acts of urban renewal um, beginning in the 1960s and then continuing through the 19 until the 1980s as well. Um, so I understand there's a, a lot more there uh, when specific, thinking specifically to um, the Lakeland community, but how can similar scholars um, become involved in communities? Whoever wants to jump in. <laughs> Maybe, maybe I can offer. So I, I'm not uh, familiar you know, with the with the community, but I think maybe picking a bit on what Prentice was saying earlier, I think there are uh, maybe at least two ways in, in which really I believe scholars might um, yeah might make concrete contributions to take Maxine's words. Um, I think if we're thinking more deeply about again the multi layer discussions at play here, uh, I think the when thinking about scholars, I think I'm also thinking uh, scholars slash um, educators. I think here we are in the context of self finding education. I believe a lot can happen in the classroom uh, in the sense of the well curriculum, the kinds of conversations we have, and in a way beginning to, to plant the seed and engage in these kinds of conversations from early on with the people who are going to be very soon planners in the field, precisely engaged in the in the institutions and in the organizations, NGOs, in activism, uh, in the communities where all um, engaged in planning and also affected with planning, right? Um, so I think that the, a lot can happen there in the sense of, um, again, ha having, bringing the conversations to begin with and begin also unsettling um, some of these taken for granted ideas around uh, the, the, the value we assign to property, private property in the context of plan and land development, et cetera. Um, and also picking up what Prentice was saying earlier, this idea of, well, um, are we qualitative, quantitative as scholars, the kind of research we might be producing and the, the ways also in which um, uh, research um, it's, is produced and, and who is it serving and what kinds of questions are we asking and what kind of priorities are uh, is our scholarship kind of following. Uh, and I believe there, uh, well, clearly the the... the the conversations we're having today are informed by the, the ideas that others have put out there, uh, by the empirical studies that people have put out, uh, out there, by the case studies. People were asking about case studies and examples uh, of what's, what's happening, doc documenting the, the many great things that are happening also in, in many communities, um, which um, th that in a way can help expand also the conversation. So I think it's, it's a bit of a potentially a virtuous cycle where, um, where, where from inside these conversations can begin to be unsettled so that the, the institutions and the systems and the regulations and all these um, really uh, sometimes monolithic spaces, which we, we see as monolithic, uh, the, the planning system, you know, uh, can begin to be transformed. I mean, we, planning systems have been created by, by people, by communities. Uh, law, uh, as hard as we see it and believe it to be, um, can, can be changed and, and the ways in which we structure our, um, our relations and our interactions with each other and with, with the ways in which we understand um, land and are, are subject to change. But, but that begins again, I think, with, um, with changing the discourse too and with questioning, thinking for granted assumptions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any follow up comments from moderators? Oh, yes. Um, Mr. Doctor, Thurston has a question. Um, Doctor, next. Oh, Dr. Doris mentioned time frames, and from a planning standpoint, um, because it's my experience, the planner is coming in after the property is sold and they're developing it. So, how do we change that? How does how do how does planning change the time frame paradigm so that some of this stuff can actually be done. <clears throat> Unmute myself. Um, you know, I, I think I think this is a this is a really great question. It, it comes back to some of what uh, Prentice was talking about in terms of 
um, thinking about governance processes that actually allow people to be involved. Um, so I think there's some, you know, and I'm not I'm not familiar with the the you know the details of planning processes in 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 the place where uh, you all are are working, but um, I you know there's a lot of similarities in in the sense that as you mentioned the the this this planning kind of happens after um, property has has changed hands. Um, you know the cities are doing very general planning maybe across a 10 year or 20 year period but the the you know the goals that are set tend to be in such general terms that they can actually be quite malleable and also i mean in, in the context of ontario we have the, the possibility um to change plans uh if if they would seem to be economically beneficial like take our best plans take our best ideas and throw them out the window if there's a you know, a higher bidder for, you know, with a, with a, a better, more uh, lucrative idea. Um, and I think changing that is, you know, something that would really require some really significant changes to um, planning frameworks. Um, and then maybe beneath that, you know, beyond that, thinking about, you know, what is the, the role of, of time in, in our planning processes? You know, in planning, we're always kind of like projecting ourselves into these futures, into these 10 or 20 year futures. Um, what if we thought more about, what if we thought more about the past? What if we thought of, you know, not, not all planning is occurring along some linear, um, you know, in a linear way and always towards, you know, Pro progress and things getting better, but what if we thought more about kind of the obligations that we have to you know, the ancestors or people who lived in these places in, in the past or maybe have become more marginalized or what about to generations that are beyond the 10 or 20 year timeline? I mean, I think there's all sorts of ways we can um, trouble the ways that that time gets mobilized in planning, you know, as a, as a, feature of governance or as a feature of the way we think about how we make plans. That's probably not the answer you were looking for, but <laughs> it's what's on my mind. Thank you. Thank you. I wanted to add something to that, if I can. Um, so I think there are like, I, from my, uh, I, I'm working with the, with MCPC right now. So from what I've learned in the little time that I'm working, I think there are like two two aspects uh, about how we go about in the future. I think it's a relationship with the communities, with the planning staff, and also there might be uh, planning advocates who at times work publicly or privately with the communities. So I can give you a small example of an area I don't want to name. Uh, so there was a private property that the owner wanted to change and get it rezoned to uh, multifamily housing. And they were planning to get the developers in, and if they get to rezone the property, they would have built like hundreds of housing units in that property. So when the property was in the process of being rezoned, the surrounding properties wanted to get rezoned to the same land use as well, so that they can also do the same. So what happened is the planning staff, if they are communicating with the communities very clearly, and the rezoning process and also the master plan is uh, conveyed, yes, they are mostly now they are involved in the engagement process, but they're also conveyed what the plans have been, how they're rezoning it, so the communities can stay alert. And that's also where the community advocates, planner, advocate planners can aware the community as well. Like, so this is how they are rezoning some of the properties in the neighborhood. This might happen in the future. So this is actually, I would say, like uh, an effort from both ends, from the planning staff, planner advocates, and also the community. So they can, they can all stay alert because eventually that property rezoning has been halted for now. Uh, we are going to talk about that maybe after the next election, because the, there were like you know, definite pushback from the communities because maybe they were sending some sort of maybe gentrification or the neighborhood character change that might happen maybe after 10 years from now on after the rezoning uh, gets initiated. So I think that's also like you know how we converse and how, cl how clear we are with what we are planning for the community. So uh, there is a political end that will always be in play that might be against the community, but I feel like if the community and planning staff can be work, can work together and create a pushback, it actually works. That is what I'm seeing right now, where I'm working. Maybe it could work in other communities as well. Thank you.
Thank yeah. you, little one. Thank you. Um, um, so we have another question from the chat. It's from Shamisha. She is a first year PhD student at Cornell in planning. Her question is, has Black and Indigenous solidarity come up in your work? How have you thought about potentially conflicting claims to land and how marginalized communities can work with or against each other? So this hasn't come up, the, the solidarity piece hasn't come up in my work specifically. One is that I probably, well, up until the last few years, I've been functioning in the US and for the most part, indigenous communities, we kind of render them invisible. So these ideas of like building solidarity across different communities has been deeply problematic when you can't even find the other community that you want to build solidarity with. I think it, to other kind of for, fortify this point um, and to this piece about how to work together, I think, yes, it, it would be great to get kind of black and indigenous solidarity in these spaces, but we need collective solidarity across more racial and ethnic groups. Because the piece that you kind of render yourselves is the, the piece, the politics around it, right, is that you get, you you may get yourself into this kind of oppressive Olympics, right, just to get this reclaim of land. And that's something that you want to deter because the solidarity is all about us having, you know, building consensus and working towards a common goal. So I think that's the piece where we're, the, the, the front end piece is really trying to build consensus, right, in terms of like what we want to do and what is our goals. And that can be done across different spaces. And I, I think about this in terms of different pieces like the civil rights movement. I think about this in terms of solidarity with Occupy Wall Street, where they were thinking about collective ways to engage different groups that largely weren't in those conversations. And instead of just functioning on like one marginalized group, there needs to be ways to build like political power or capacity across different arenas and sectors. And this goes kind of back to the other question about, you know, how do you include scholars within these, these kind of conversations? How are you as planning students engaging in these works? And even in my own kind of approach to research, like I, you know, I, I play the academic game, I publish, you know, solo author papers, but I get more and kind of impactful experiences working with people from other disciplines. So I'm, my PhD is in public affairs, obviously I function a lot in planning, but I function obviously in sociology a lot, as well as economics and public policy and public administration, because I do understand and do see that there's limits in each disciplinary way. So to be an interdisciplinary scholar for me is to fill in those gaps. And I would say that in terms of how you think about yourselves as planners, planners function and work in different spaces, right? You have planners that for, uh, work for city government, some that work for nonprofits, some that work for private corporations and developers. But how can you think about planning as a, a, as a collective group that's really trying to change those ideologies or those thoughts or those ideas within those spaces that they work? And for me, as a, like an educator, it would be one to get you all to be like advocates, right, or organizers in the spaces which you're working to type to really think about how to drive these systemic or systematic changes that we're talking about. You know, I'm I'm burnt out. I'm tired. I'm I'm like literally thinking about how to get a sabbatical because I know that this is the space that I find drive and passionate in, but it's also a space that I know is just not for me to work in. So how to how can I bring other you know colleagues and disciplines and 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 um, industries and stakeholders to the table to work collectively to this common goal so that so we can build a capacity to really push this forward, and it's a sustainability issue, right? And we see this with a lot of you know research on social movements. There's burnout. So how do you get this kind of continuous process for people participating in these collective efforts is a bigger thing. And lastly, I'll say, you know, we ask a lot of the public, we ask communities in public to do a lot of different things. We ask them to be involved. We ask them to show up to meetings. We ask them to, you know, give their ideas to plans and we don't pay them for anything. We just ask them to say that like, this is what it means to be a good citizen, which is also reifying our notion of what it means to be an American in these spaces. So for me, it's like, how can you take the burdens off of the community to make these decisions and know that, you know, we should, as a, we as a government authority or a nonprofit should be sharing these voices for the community while being in consultation with them. And I think that's the pieces where, you know, some of us are in these positions where we're paid to have these kind of advocacy efforts if we want to. And I think that's the piece where we need to be pushing more while still consulting communities. Because the, the issue I see is a lot of un, unpaid labor and burdens placed on community members to re-envision and reimagine their own places. And it's like, they didn't make it their places, these places of marginality or despair. So how can we actually include them and advocate for on their behalf and for me, that's the, the number one role of a planner is to really be an advocate for the public at large. Thank you so much for the wonderful response. Um, and thank you for all our presenters. Thank you so much for being here today, um, for being part of this dialogue.